Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our Marketing Club webinar series, the first one of the 2023-2024 academic year. We've got a great session today with Daniel Rawls, who will guide you through the latest trends in digital marketing. Daniel has presented at many CI events and webinars over the past few years, so it's an absolute pleasure to have him with us again for today's session. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today's session, Daniel Rawls. If you'd like to turn your webcam on, Daniel, I'll pass things over to you and the floor is yours when you're ready. All right, welcome everyone. Very good introduction. Thank you very much, Phil. Appreciate that. And uh, let's get into it. Let me start by introducing myself uh, and explain what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk latest trends in digital marketing. Um, I'm Daniel Rolls. I run a company called Target Internet. Target Internet works in very close partnership with the Chartered Industry Marketing. We do things like provide the digital marketing e-learning. I teach on behalf of the CIM. Uh, and together we are working with lots and lots of clients, as you can see on the page here, helping them upskill their teams uh, around digital marketing. So what I'm gonna try and do today is talk about some of the trends and the challenges uh, all of these organizations and lots of others uh, are facing. Um, as well as running Target Internet, I'm also a program director at Imperial College, where I head up uh, digital transformation, digital marketing, and data science. And I do a lot of teaching within executive education, which is where we teach companies within the MBA programs. And these are some of my lovely previous MSc students uh, as well. Uh, as well as that, I also do something called the Digital Marketing Podcast, which I know at least a few of you uh, listen to. I'll highlight this as well. It's a weekly podcast, also done as a video. Uh, where we interview lots of people and just give you regular updates uh, on what's happening in the world of digital marketing. Um, and I've also written a few topics, a few books on the topic, which sadly for a few of you are course texts that you're going to have to read. But for the rest of you, we won't mention these books again, um, I promise. So what I want to do is go through some key trends. And it's a really interesting time to be doing this just because there is so much changing at the moment, which makes things somewhat challenging for marketers and for, for students and for entrepreneurs, but actually it's a really interesting time. And there's lots of opportunity to do interesting things. And we have to start really with artificial intelligence because it's what everyone's talking about at the moment, but it actually has a knock-on impact on loads of other areas within, within digital marketing as well. So if we kind of start with the, the basics a little bit. So there's been AI around within digital marketing for quite a time. And GPT, the thing that chat GPT is based on, has actually been around for a while, but the chat interface is what really is, has kind of brought it to the forefront. And if you think about you know, what we take for granted now, the World Wide Web, I call it internet as we generally refer to it, the reality is the internet was around for a long time, but the web became a thing when we got the interface, just like the GPT became a thing when we got the interface, the GPT. And what we're really finding with chat GPT is there is a set of skills in their own right for actually writing prompts uh, for it as well. Now, I'm sure most of you have, have kind of played around with this already as well, uh, but a little tip with this. There is an extension for Google Chrome uh, called Keywords Everywhere. Now, I always like to give lots of takeaways within my sessions. So at the end of this, to try and persuade you to stay to the end, uh, are lots of links where you can download uh, lots of the things that I'm gonna mention in the session today. So I'll highlight those at the end, but there's this great extension for Google Chrome called Keywords Everywhere. And it does lots of really good things for keyword research and for content research. So it'd be really useful for any digital marketing activity you're doing. But what it's also really great for is helping you write prompts for ChatGPT. So if you've got the Chrome extension installed, you launch up ChatGPT, paid for free version. And down on the bottom left, you're gonna have this little K uh, little symbol you can click on. You click on that and it will give you loads of options. And what I've done here is I've put marketing, writing, and then I've picked a marketing writing model. And this is the BAB model, which is the before after bridge model. And it's quite often used in writing advertising. Um, and it's given me an instruction, I just fill in the theme. So if I read this out here, it says, please ignore all previous instructions, because otherwise it will refer back to what it's speaking about previously. Please respond only in the English language, because it's learning Spanish at the moment. So there's some strange things were going on. You're an expert copywriter, so getting it to role play, that speaks and writes fluent English. Do not self-reference, because otherwise it will refer back things it says previously. Do not explain what you're doing, because otherwise it will tell you what it's doing as it's doing it. And then write a witty, 
because I've given it a tone of voice. BAB, before, after bridge, marketing campaign for, and I have to put the topic in here. For the sake of this, I put puppies. And then it does the before. So meet Frank, he used to come home to a long day at work, or to an empty house. And then it's got the after. Now Frank's greeted with an explosion of tail wags, sloppy kisses, and boundless love. And then the bridge, want to experience this canine infused transformation, introducing positively yours. What was interesting with this is it had a go at being witty with the positively yours uh, brand name. It's used the bridge and it's actually quite nice copy. And the difference between getting some great copy out of this and not so great is the way that we're writing prompts. So as a set of skills, uh, when we're recruiting marketers now, we're looking for people, we don't mind people using AI tools, but we want to know they can prompt them effectively. So I certainly would say learning that as a, as a set of skills and experimenting with it um, becomes really important. So that, that's a kind of starting point. Um, the reality of this is that things have shifted pretty quickly as well. So it was originally ChatGPT trained on data up to 2021. So you couldn't get it to look things up. It didn't know anything about what had happened after that point. Now, um, I've got access to a number of different features. You'll notice a load of them say beta. In order to see these features, you need to go to your settings in ChatGPT and turn on beta features. So the, the ones that are probably most interesting, um, plugins, plugins will allow you to do lots of different things. You can switch on three plugins at a time and it will allow you to look things up online. It will allow you to create charts, to create PDF documents, to go and analyze a PDF document, a course text or something along those lines. And you could, you could do lots of interesting things with that. Data analysis is really interesting because it would do a lot of data science analysis that previously you would have probably had to have known how to use something like Power BI really effectively, or even more likely known a little bit of Python coding um, to be able to do these things. And now you can do this, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. And we've also uh, in here got access to DALI 3, DALI 3 being the new version of OpenAI who created ChatGPT's their image uh, generation tool. There are other image generation tools like Midjourney and various others out there, but I'll show you why this is quite interesting. So not only have we got ChatGPT, we need to learn to prompt, but actually as a marketer now, I'm having to stay up to date with all these quick changes. Because if I don't, I'm at a disadvantage by the marketers because they're gonna better create content more quickly, they're gonna better create images easily, they're gonna better analyze data, create charts, graphs, maybe look at the customer data, analyze which these customers are likely to churn, so there's a lot of quite advanced things that would have taken a long time before that are getting quicker. And this is only happening more and more quickly. For the advanced users out there that are already using this stuff, there is a developer conference coming up uh, for OpenAI. Keep an eye out for what they're announcing about AI agents. Um, if you're not familiar, AI agents is when an AI, um, you can go off and use various different agents. So you could use ChatGPT, but you could use other AIs as well but you can put them into sequences and loops. Uh, and what that basically means is that you'll be able to get them to create a task list and then go through that task list and start creating and completing those tasks. It's moving very quickly. Really important to try and try and stay up to date with these things as well. Uh, just to show you how uh, advanced Dali's kind of moved on. One of the big problems with these AI tools was one, they couldn't do text properly. So you tell them to put a word in, and it would basically go through and just put some like hieroglyphics looking kind of text in. They're also really bad with hands and with faces sometimes. It was quite ghoulish what they would create. Dali 3 gets over all of those problems. So I've gone in here and said, uh, create a book cover for a children's book uh, in a particular style uh, and call it The Adventures of Eddie and Walter. I have two beagles. They are called Eddie and Walter. And the top left image is uncanny how much it actually looks like them obviously without the, the pith helmet. Um, but you can see the, the, the ability now to include text in things. Well, from a marketing point of view, that's really important. If I wanna do a heading uh, for a blog post, or if I wanna go through and create a social media image, now much easier to do that kind of stuff as well. But not only are we getting this within things like ChatGPT, tools like Canva, which is a kind of graphics editing package online, allows you to edit movies, those kind of things as well, is actually now, also having lots of AI tools built in. So you can ask it to create an image, but also you give it a theme, you give it subscriptions, and it will create lots of marketing assets for you all in one go. So streamlining what we're doing. 
The thing is, because everyone's got this, it's very easy to use it in an average way. So if you're going to use it, that skill of prompting becomes more important because you still need your content uh, to really stand out from that point of view as well. Uh, yeah, so look out in bookshop soon. I think I might actually write this book at some point as well. Um, if we're going through as well, look at this data analysis piece. What I've done here is taken some data. Um, this is from a, a very academic website. So this is the UK Ecology and Hydrology website. So it's all about collecting data from our rivers, uh, from our farmland, from our forests and all those kind of things, and then making that data available to people so they can look at things that will improve farming, that will be good for sustainability, uh, we'll go through, we'll stop river pollution, all, all those kind of different things. The problem is very often that data is in a set that's very hard for your, your kind of average person to access. And all I've done here is go to this website and I download a load of data on how many ash trees there are across the UK and where they are. And I've just downloaded this massive data set um, and I don't know anything about the data and I've just gone up and I've uploaded it into ChatGPT. And I said, analyze this data. That's literally the instruction I've given it. It goes in, it was a zip file. So it says, well, first of all, we're gonna unzip the zip file. Great, inside that, there are four files. I think this is the one with the data. Looking at the columns, I think this is what's in each of the columns. Based on this, I'm gonna go in and analyze these things. Is that okay? And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And it says, right, let's analyze this. I'm not sure I understand this, so I'm gonna check something else. And it kind of just goes through a conversation with you and then says, okay, how do you wanna, to track chat sound. I said, well, why don't you do a 3D distribution of where these are? Um, and then it's gone through and it's basically said to me, based on the longitude and latitude of the map of the UK, uh, how many ash trees there are in any particular location. And it kind of correlates to where forests are and things like that. But we can also start to look at the impacts of environmental factors and so on. So this is going to be really, really important for making data science accessible to a broader range of people great for topics like sustainability, but actually as marketers, we get loads of data. We might have a load of data in our CRM, our customer relationship management system. We can export that as maybe a, you know, a text file of some description. What I can now do is upload that into ChatGPT and go analyze this for me without needing those kind of data science skills. So just playing around with this is, is really worthwhile. Um, and in fact, you can upload files, even if it's a zip file, it can be really powerful doing this so moving pretty quickly but worth having a play around even if you're not having any interest in data science the problem with all this is it's creating more noise we already as marketers had this hugely noisy environment this is a screenshot from a, a website that was called internet live stats and what this was trying to show me is you know what's happened so far online and the, the reality of this is that we've just got huge amounts of blog posts millions and millions huge amounts of videos being uploaded etc etc and the reality is that cutting through this noise has got increasingly difficult and now that there's ai generated content that's got even harder because there's more blog posts and there's more videos and what it means is if you're going to create content there is no point doing it unless it is exceptional because it just won't cut through this level of noise so yes content marketing is really important and I'm going to come back to content marketing skills in a bit. But the reality is we need to get better and better at this. And there was an interesting point that was made. I went to the HubSpot conference inbound um, in September in Boston, in the US. And there were, everyone was talking AI to the point it became a bit of a joke where people were counting how many words in each presenter said the word AI. But what was interesting is people said, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't fair. We're having to compete with AIs now. And the point that Google made was, no, you're just competing with other marketers that are using AI. So if you're not, you're potentially at a disadvantage. So if I, I give you some kind of examples. So we could use ChatGPT. What we've also got here is a, a brilliant tool called Jasper. Jasper is a kind of writing interface that lives on top of GPT. There is a free trial of this that's in the toolkit I'll give you at the end. So I think you get 10,000 words for free. Um, so you can play around with this if you want to. The nice things about this, it makes it really easy that you can teach your brand tone of voice. So I can say, right, this is our tone of voice. I can point it at some content that we've already done and it will try and learn what the, the brand tone of voice is from that. But I can also tell it facts. This is the company name. These are the, the key members of staff. This is what we do. This is where we're based. This is the podcast that we do. 
and so on. So it knows facts about the organization, it's got the right tone of voice, and then I can ask it to write in the appropriate tone, and it can include appropriate facts about my product, services, team members, those sorts of things as well. Some ethical challenges with this uh, as well. So say I say to, I was teaching an undergrad class, and I said, can you go and write me something about the PDCA model? Plan, do, check, act, it's like an iterative model. Very, very easy now, anything like that, just to go in here, type in PDCA model, select professional tone of voice, and it's written out here. Uh, the PDCA model, also known as a Deming cycle, is a continuous improvement strategy used in business and industry. It, and it's nicely written, it's a definition. It'll probably do a, a pretty good job of this. The challenge here for me as uh, a lecturer, if I put my lecturer's hat on for a moment, is that I don't know if you use ChatGP to write this. The reality is as well, what I can do is I can select a paragraph of this. In the top right, there's a little recycle button. Hit rewrite and it will rewrite it and it's undetectable where it came from. What I can also then is highlight it, hit plagiarism check and it will do a plagiarism check to see if that exists anywhere online. So there's some ethical questions starting to come out from this. Is that acceptable? You need to check, by the way, of your institutions, uh, if you are uh, uh, use, uh, any academic institution, if you're allowed to use these tools or not. I would say the skill of learning to write really well should come first and then we can start to use these tools, just like we do mental arithmetic before we start using a calculator to make things quicker as well. So great tools. The problem is that the Kindle store is full of books that have been stolen by other people's books, rewritten in a tool like this, and then published as a new book. And it's pretty much undetectable at the moment. We've been doing some research at Imperial College into that as well. But Jasper, brilliant tool as a marketer. They've now got a campaign builder, which is a lot of fun. You go in, give it a title, give it a really descriptive brief and select what you want. I want a blog, a press release, five Instagram posts, uh, whatever it might be, and it will write the whole lot for you in seconds, which can really start to streamline some of your processes. But if you do it badly, it will be average and it really won't get the traction potentially either. Now, AI agents, I mentioned, you're, this is what you're going to see more of in, in the near future. So, and I'll show you where they are now and where they're moving to. So I've gone into this one and I've said plan a marketing strategy to promote Jersey in the Channel Islands, because that's where I live. I'm not actually there today, I'm in, in London today, uh, to attract tourists with a high level of disposable income. Stage one, develop a task list, and I want you then to iterate. Okay, so it goes off and it does stage one that I asked it to do, and it says develop a task list. So the agent goes off and does that. And at the moment it's using GPT, and it says, well, I've created a task list. So it says step one, gather data on potential target markets, demographics, disposable income, geographic location. So quite a good starting point, build my persona basically. Research current marketing programs. So what else is going on already? Establish goals and objectives. Always need to start with that. Develop a budget and it goes on and it kind of gives you all the standard things you would really hope for in a marketing plan. But then, because it's an agent, it goes, right, I'll go off and I'll look at task one. And then I'll do task one. Now, what used to happen, it used to say, right, I will research customer preferences and behaviors related to travel and tourism in the Channel Islands by collecting and analyzing data from relevant market surveys, focus groups, and interviews. That sounds good, but the problem was it told you what it was going to do, but it wasn't then able to do it. The reality now is because we have plugins and extensions and web lookup, it's able to do those things. So I've just, I've just done it here. Uh, and it's used two plugins. It's used the Wolfram plugin, which is quite good for doing data analysis. Uh, and it's used a plugin called World News to look at latest trends. And I've asked it in this case to create um, a persona for a digital marketing manager, including average salary, frustrations in regards to their career and what they want. And it's told me the US average salary, the UK average salary, it's told me its responsibilities, but the frustration is really interesting. Keeping up the latest trends in digital marketing proven in return on investment. Well, these are all things I know that marketers struggle with. So he's done it really well. So when you combine GPT as in chat GPT, DALI for creating images, uh, you've got lots of other AIs being created, and then you can use this kind of agent model to iterate through loops of tasks, it starts to get quite interesting. Because you say, create me a marketing strategy, give it a good brief, it will go up, look up relevant data, create it, create a PDF document for you, grab an image, generate an image for the persona and so on. So what we need to make sure as marketers is that we keep our skills very up to date because some of the things we're doing now will disappear or 
We all just need to know really, has it done a good job? Do I know enough about the topic to know that was a good list of a, of a strategy plan in the first place? Because if you don't, you're gonna create rubbish uh, using these tools potentially. So keep an eye out for this agent stuff. Uh, it's getting really interesting and it, it's moving really, really quickly at the moment as well. That moves us on quite nicely into this kind of topic around data and trust. And the two things are, are quite closely connected, but we'll, we'll get into them more broadly uh, as well. So let's try and talk about a particular topic uh, first, which is GA4, Google Analytics 4. Okay, if you have the skill to use GA4 really effectively, it's hugely in demand. So what, if you're not familiar, what happened in July of this year, the old version of Google Analytics stopped collecting data. And they've been telling people for a year, you need to move away to GA4. The problem was that GA4, uh, nobody really understood it. It's not as easy to set up as the previous version of analytics, and it's certainly not as intuitive to use. The reason they had to move it forward is the way they were collecting data was deemed as inappropriate or illegal in a few EU countries. Uh, but also, they stopped collecting as much cookie data because of browsers blocking cookies and phones blocking cookies. I'll talk about cookies a bit more in a moment. So they find themselves in a situation where they have to, Google has to move to this new version as quickly as possible. But what a lot of people didn't realize is that the previous version, Universal Analytics, actually had a lot of limitations anyway. So if I give you some context, so say I arrive on a website on page A and I'm there for five seconds, then I move to page B and I'm there for five minutes, which is 300 seconds. What's the average page visit duration? But well, what we might do is take a mean average, which is say, right, we'll add the two together, 300 plus five, uh, that'll give me 305 seconds. I divide it in half and I come up with 152 and a half seconds. That's not what Universal Analytics did because the problem with Universal Analytics, all it knew is when you arrived on a page, that you'd viewed that page. So it knew when I arrived on page A, it knew when I'd arrived on page B. It could tell how long I was on page A by just deducting one time from the other. But because there was no page C, I had no idea how long I was on that page, which meant page B was actually counted as zero, which means the last page you were on never counted, which is kind of nonsense because very often the last page we're on is the page we're on the longest. So actually what your analytics would have told you is that the average page visit duration was five seconds, which is clearly nonsense. So GA4 solves this problem and many others because it now knows what's happening within pages. It knows if you're scrolling and how far you scroll. It knows if you're playing videos as standard YouTube videos, but you can track other types as well. If you've downloaded a PDF, if you've clicked on a link onto a third party website, if you have started to fill a form and if you completed that form, if you did an internal search, all of this is stuff we didn't have before unless we'd added extra code to our website. So it's actually a lot more powerful um, from that point of view. But there's, there's some terminology changes that we're gonna to need to know to get the most out of it. The key thing about GA4 is that the basic reports there, but there's not many there, you need to be able to edit these reports and to create custom reports. And it's really worth understanding a bit of terminology. So three phrases that are probably really useful. First of all, everything is now an event. Page view is an event. So that, that page being looked at. Um, a form starting to be filled in an event. A form being completed is an event. A PDF download is an event. These are all different events that we can track. And that's what it's reporting on. So we can go through and we can track all those kind of events happening. And then a lot of the reports have what we call dimensions and metrics. So in this case, on the left-hand side, the things you can see are the values of the dimension. The dimension is the channel groups. You know, so where's my traffic coming from? Organic search, Google search, or is it coming from paid search, or is it coming from somewhere else like that? So the dimensions we see are something to describe something about something. So in this case, it's describing what channel it is that I came from. The metrics are numbers that are related to that. So average engagement time, engage sessions per user. So basically how many times is the average person coming along? Um, how many events did they trigger each time they visited? So a session is basically a visit. What's the engagement rate there for? And so on. So it's really worth understanding that you get dimensions, you can add secondary dimensions. So I could say, yes, it's organic search, but what search engine was it? So I could say, right, I wanna know the, what's called the source and the medium. So I can add those dimensions, second dimensions. And then with all of these reports, I can add different metrics. 
that I'm trying to track. So whenever you go to any GA4 report, you'll see these things showing up. Over on the right hand side, top right hand side, you can edit that report. And you can change what's visualized, you can change the charts to charts. That's where the power really is, or in the custom reports um, as well. Quick tip as well. When you edit the standard reports, you can just hit save and it will save over the standard report for everyone. So don't do that, save it as a new report because yeah, you're gonna find that you're gonna confuse everyone else and confuse yourself probably uh, in the long term as well. So we've basically got a bit of new terminology and it's worth explaining the difference between how it used to be and how it is now. We used to talk about goals a lot and a goal was somebody doing the thing you wanted them to do. And you had four options, destination, Someone got to my thank you page, thank you for buying, thank you for filling in the form. I know you've done something then. Duration, someone stays more than five minutes. Pages per session, someone looks at more than three pages. Or an event, well that meant we'd added extra code to our web pages to track something. So most of us just ended up using destination goals. You got to a page, I know you did something, therefore I'm gonna track that. Or we don't have goals at all anymore. It's all now moved to conversion events. So what it means is when you go into GA4, you're going to need to set these up because you're not really going to get the most um, out of it otherwise, and it can be a bit confusing. So what you would generally do is you start by creating in the settings a new event. And let's, let's think about it in a couple of different scenarios. So maybe I create an event and I have to give it a name. So first of all, there'll be a drop down. You can write anything you want in, use something in the drop down. Uh, these are called recommended events. And recommended events will show up in all the standard reports. It's always great. Uh, if you don't use those names, it will just be hidden. You'll have to create a new report to see it. So don't, you don't want to do that. So use the drop down and, and select it. Then you're going to say, okay, I want to create an event, give it a name. And then what happens? Well, it's a page view. Okay. But then you need to add a condition. So it's when someone gets to this particular page, or maybe it's a form being filled in. The condition is it's this particular form or it's on this page. Or maybe it's a video, bit, video being viewed, but it's a video on this particular page. So you'll give it an action, an event, and there's loads of standard ones, you know, page view, scroll, all that kind of stuff. But then you need to give it a condition of saying it was the form on this particular page, my thank you form, thank you for buying. Okay. If you do that, you create an event, and then you can say that's a conversion event. Now, I've got instructions to do this in detail, which I'll, I'll provide afterwards, but the point being that it's not as easy to set up as it was before. Learning that as a skill set is really in demand at the moment because there's just not many marketers that have learned it. They feel a bit overwhelmed by the whole thing and they've stepped away. I promise you it's not that complicated. You just, once you understand some of these fundamentals, it makes a big difference. So big change in the marketing world. You'd think, you know, it was based in July when it happened. Most organizations still haven't got their head around this. A lot of them haven't even got it set up properly yet either. So a good set of skills to learn. Let's come back to this cookie piece, because this is really fundamentally changing how Google work, how Facebook work, and people like that. So you would have heard the blocking of third-party cookies. And I think a lot of people don't really understand in detail what this means, so it's worth, worth getting your head around. So you go in your browser, the cookie is something that's being set in your browser just to remember what you've done previously. Say I go to a news website, and on that news website, uh, I see some ads. The cookie's gonna be set on my machine to remember what I've seen and what I haven't seen. So maybe I go to site one. Who's setting the cookie in my browser? Well, it's not site one, that would be the first party, the website, it's not them. And actually it's not the second party, it's not the advertiser that's setting the cookie. In reality, in this situation, it's the advertising network. The Google Display Network, in this case, just as an example, and they're placing ads across three million different websites, tracking what you look at, and then kind of using that to target stuff at you. Well, Safari, for example, and other browsers have come out and said, we did opt in for third-party cookies when we clicked on that thing. Do you want to use this website? Yeah, get out of the way, I don't care. But actually, we probably didn't know what we were opting in for. So Safari said, right, we're blocking them from now on. That's a clever move for two reasons. One, it basically positions Safari and Apple as you know, trustworthy, but also it denies their competitors, Google, Facebook, and other people of lots of data they had before. Now, even Google came out quite some time ago, more than a year ago, and said, yeah, we kind of agree, third-party cookies aren't perfect. We're gonna come up with a new solution. 
they haven't started doing that yet. I had an announcement of recently they're going to start in Google Chrome blocking third party cookies or moving away from them in January of 2024. So, so what does that mean? It just means they'll have less of this form of data. So what else are they doing? Well, they're now collecting data in different ways. But if you think about it, if you've got this cookie data and I know what you've searched for in Google and what you look at in YouTube and what you're saying in Gmail, I can use all of that and I can start to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to start to model what different people will do. So let's take an example of that in practice. This is really important if you're, if you're getting into doing any Google ads as well. This is a performance max campaign. And instead of me going in and saying, right, here's the ad I want, and I want to put it in front of people in London on this day, you know, with, of this demographic. Instead of doing that, I just point it at my website and it finds images and logos and videos text and descriptions, I can edit those and highlight. But what it's really gonna do is say, I think your website's about this, so I'm gonna start showing your ads to people. And it's using all of these assets, mixing them up in different ways, and showing them in YouTube, Gmail, Google search results, the display network, which is those three million websites I talked about, and then the Google, the Discover app for Google. And then it will work out, this headline with this description, this text works really well for this type of person. And it keeps testing and testing and testing until it works out what's actually working and what's not. So this is an example of Google kind of moving away from the cookie piece and moving much more towards the machine learning because they haven't got that same level of cookie data. What's also important to kind of understand is one, you've lost control of your brand a little bit because you don't know which heading, which, which description, which, which image. So therefore it's worth thinking about all those options. But also these campaigns are generally performing much, much better than your standard campaign. But this will only work well if you have GA4 set up properly. Why is that? Because if you've set your conversion events up, it knows what you're trying to achieve and then it will optimize for those things. Without that, it's gonna make it really hard to go through uh, and kind of optimize in that way as well. So let's move on, uh, talk about some other trends as well. Um, I haven't embedded this in because playing videos and audio um, and go to meeting is not, not always 100% reliable. But what I've done here, this is a tool called Descript. And Descript is a tool that basically allows me to edit podcasts very easily. So I upload a podcast, it creates a transcription. I can then edit that podcast by editing the transcription. So I can cut a piece of text out, it will cut it out the audio. It also does the same with video. It does a brilliant thing now. If you're recording a video straight to camera like I am now, but actually I'm reading some notes, I might be looking over here. And if my eyes are going backwards and forwards on the notes, that looks terrible on the video. It now has an AI tool that will make it look like I'm looking at the camera. And it will correct my eyes so they're going forwards as well. It's quite unnerving because it does a good job. The other thing it does is um, very much make it possible to deep fake someone's voice. I mean, I've, I've got hours and hours of podcast recordings and I've literally just typed something out, select virtual Daniel, and it will read it in my voice and it is indistinguishable um, to, in most extent. What you'll notice though, if I point it out here, is that the, pod, the sentence says, welcome back to the Digital Marketing Podcast. My name's Daniel Rolls and I'll be your host through the fast changing world of digital skills. I've spelled podcast incorrectly. It looks like I put an R in it. The reason for that is when it does the kind of fake of my voice, otherwise it's says podcast which is very American. Whereas if I put an R in podcast, it sounds much more English. So it's, it's not 100%, but it's very, very easy to do. So if you've got a recording of anyone's voice, uh, you can pretty easily deep fake them at this stage. So we've got to be careful. So trust in anything that we hear is going to disappear. What does that mean from a marketing point of view? And no one really knows as yet. But if you've got anyone's voice, politician, celebrity, anyone else that's been recorded, you can deep fake their voice now from that point of view. The, the kind of other side of this, and this is, and I'll, I can share this video afterwards. This is from um, what was some work at, was going on at, at Meta previously, you know, Facebook. And when you see what they're doing, you know, with, with um, the whole kind of metaverse thing, you might be a little bit suspicious, but actually, I think, well, is it really worth it? Is it, have they made a bit of a misstep here? What you can see here is basically uh, the, the person on the camera here takes their phone and scans their own face. It takes about 15 seconds to scan their face, pulls lots of different faces. Then within about an hour, it generates an avatar that is photo realistic. And then she can write things in, it deep fakes her voice, it makes her facial movement, it moves her eyes, and you could use this for creating videos, 
for doing virtual calls, all those kind of things. But also you can go into virtual reality or augmented reality and you can put yourself into that location using your avatar. And these avatar technology is moving pretty quickly. We're seeing it with a new Google headset um, that's coming out as well. Because imagine you've got your headset on and you're doing uh, maybe a Zoom call or um, something like that. And the other person isn't got a headset on. It's going to look a bit strange that you're sitting there on a Zoom call with a headset on. So instead of doing that, it generates an avatar of you that's supposed to be photorealistic to your page as well, so to your face, sorry. So we're not quite there with this stuff, but we can deep fake audio almost 100%. Deep faking video, it's getting there pretty quickly. So we're in a world where we can't trust anything we hear and actually trusting anything we see um, is going to be increasingly kind of challenging as well. Now, the logical future of this is that at the moment, we've got our mobile devices. We're looking at those you know, 120, 150 times a day, depending on the stats you look at. Then Apple have released their augmented reality headset. So you can overlay things to what you're seeing, but there's a bit of friction it gets in the way. Then we'll probably be having a pair of glasses that can do the same thing. This uh, is something called Mojo. This takes the next step. This is a contact lens that can overlay things on top of what you see. Now, bear that in mind. That means you can change what things look like and you can change what you look like to other people. If any of you have been watching Black Mirror, uh, you'll be familiar with some of these ideas already. There's a great presentation. Um, and if you've seen one of our presentations, before, I've mentioned this before, so, so forgive me, but uh, Samsung, when they kind of launched the prototype of this product, uh, they came on stage at Mobile World Congress and said, imagine that you have a pet cat. Everyone looked really confused, but you wish that you had a pet dog. When you look at the cat, it will just look like a dog. Now, you don't need to extrapolate that very far to work out. My wife won't be looking at this anymore. She'll have Brad Pitt or someone else walking around the house. But as marketers, getting our head around what it means when we can change what things look like. At the moment, you might have an ad blocker built into your browser. You could have a brand blocker for everywhere in the world. If you're going to boycott a brand for ethical reasons, you can make it disappear. You won't see it. What if you've got a really annoying colleague? Well, you could create a colleague blocker. Uh, and you can make them invisible. So we're, we're, this is a kind of logical conclusion of where it's going, but it also opens uh, an awful lot of questions. And that brings us to the last topic I just want to talk about for, for five minutes or so, which is there's a lot of talk about community. And it's kind of worth trying to understand why that's the case. In a really noisy environment, broadcasting to your audience is hard. But if we can create a community of people that are speaking to each other, that's quite powerful. And that will cut through a lot of the noise because people will seek out that engagement. And it's multi-way communications. So it's a you speaking to your audience, your audience speaking to each other, the audience speaking back to us, and so on as well. So generating community becomes pretty powerful. And I'll give you some practical examples. So really, there have been three eras of marketing. Starting with mass media. When we started seeing huge brand building advertising and big TV ads and big print ads. And then we moved into the world of digital. And um, first of all, digital is very mass media. Get stuff, broadcast it out to everyone. But then we started to get smart and we moved into what we kind of refer to as personalization. So the right content to the right person at the right time in the right channel. In reality, we're still really bad at this because we haven't integrated all of our systems. A lot of three letter acronyms coming up. So we haven't integrated our CRM, our customer relationship management, with our ESP our email service provider, in turn with our CMS content management system, in line with our ERP, our enterprise resource planning, et cetera, et cetera. Have we put our systems together? So when you hit my website, I know what you've done at the call center or what products you bought previously, or just what you've done on my website before. In my email system, can I look at what type of customer you are, et cetera? So that's, that's where we are, but really we're not doing a great job of it. So we need to get better at this stuff. Um, and the more we can do this, the more we can really personalize and make sure I'm not just shouting at you and broadcasting at you. I'm giving you the right stuff that's really relevant to you. I'm really understanding your user journey, not giving you the wrong stuff and so on. And then we move into this kind of next era, supposedly, which is a community of shared relevance. So that shared relevance, well, like a family is a type of community, a neighborhood is a type of community. But actually, what about marketers? Uh, in companies where there is only one marketer that are trying to stay up to date with digital marketing. That's quite a nice niche community I could speak to. Or I could speak to people that are marketing directors that have got teams 
that they're really struggling to keep up. So those are both communities I could create that would be useful for my organization. But in order to make that into the kind of two-way com conversation, I need to think about how I'm going to, where's that going to live? Could live in a, a social discussion group. So it could be in Slack, it could be in a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group, although those things are hard to manage. It could be that actually this lives in real world meetups. Now for us, we've done this in a slightly different way. We have our podcast, so we are kind of broadcasting out, but we encourage people to come back and fill in forms and sign up for emails and ask us questions. And then we have an email newsletter, and I would really encourage you to think of email as a social channel. It's never define it as one, but think of it as a two-way channel. You email people, they should be able to email you back. It shouldn't be like a no reply email. It's a terrible, terrible bit of user experience. So I can say, right, if you love the podcast and you're trying to stay up to digital marketing, subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you out really useful stuff, but you can reply to that and ask us questions. Then we'll do live webinars like this, where you can ask questions and you can engage and so on as well. So we're starting to create a bit more of a community around something and that feels more connected. And by doing that, we can cut through the noise because that's our trusted source of information. It's not just somebody trying to sell me something, it's a community that's coming together. Um, and trying to kind of engage and learn in this case. So let's uh, go through and give some examples, look at some, some resources. Uh, first of all, if you want an example of community for something you wouldn't think would work particularly well, take a look at HubSpot. HubSpot is a B2B, it's a business to business, customer relationship management system. And they have done brilliantly well. First of all, market themselves almost like a consumer brand. But secondly, they have these big communities. If you ever go to the HubSpot conference, which I really recommend, they have meetups of all these different groups of people and they get people together and engage. And actually their biggest sales route is through their partners and their partners resell their product. So they bring those people together and so on. So it's a nice example of building community of something you would think doesn't necessarily work particularly well. So general advice and then some resources to finish me up. In an environment where it's noisier and noisier, and when you have got more and more AI tools, it's more and more important that we lean into our humanity. And what I mean by that is what makes us human. It's our ability to communicate with each other. It's our ability to understand how someone else is feeling. It's the ability to connect. All of those things are really important and they will help you to cut through the level of noise that we're potentially dealing with. Now, where I first heard this, just to credit this, um, there's a uh, Professor Celia Moore from Imperial College who is an ethics professor. And she's really concerned about the, the fact that we're spending more time online, we're interacting with AIs more, we're spending less human connection. and We're doing more Zoom calls, we're not necessarily seeing each other face to face and so on. So actually that leaning into our humanity is really important. So we keep that connection. And actually as marketers, think about that. How, how can that help us to cut through things and really connect with our target audience, understand what they need and what they want and provide that in an appropriate kind of way. So some resources that you can take away. Um, first of all, we do something called the Digital Skills Benchmark, uh, Digital Marketing Skills Benchmark with the CIM every year. We've just completed the brand new one. If you want to, you can benchmark yourself for free. You can benchmark your team if you've got a team uh, or a group of you for free as well. Just to show you what's happened the results this year. Um, what you'll see, it's quite hard to make out the screen, but I'll describe it. In the darker green is where we were in 2021. 2023, where we are now, the lighter green, it's been a small increase, but not a huge amount. You'll also notice most of it is really close to the center still. You know, we're terrible at content marketing still. Analytics skills have fallen backwards potentially. On the right, it shows us confidence. And you can see there's a lot of confidence in content particularly, but we're really rubbish at it. So it's quite telling. We've broken this down by industry. We've broken it down by seniority. So you can download the report for free. You don't even need to put an email in. Uh, and also you can benchmark yourself as well. We won't share that with anyone, uh, I promise. Um, so I'll give you the link for that in just a second. Biggest risk in this we found was head of department level because those people are now managing a team, but they're not actually doing the doing anymore. So their skills are falling behind. So go and have a look at the report. It covers content, strategy, analytics, email, social media, all those different topics. You can see where skills are. What it means though is you don't have to be 100%. You just need to be better than everyone else at this, which isn't that hard to do. So there's a really good opportunity in some of these kind of spaces still. Now, all of the websites, uh, the little tools I mentioned, are in our digital marketing toolkit. So if you Google digital marketing toolkit, 
at the top of Google below the ads, um, you will see the target internet website. Click on that, and it's got it's, it's a curated list of all the best tools. Um, or you go targetinternet.com forward slash toolkit. We also do a toolkit awards that we've you'll see that it highlights the one that won the awards. I'm in there as well. There's a downloadable PDF, and there's also a kind of interactive version. So no adverts or anything in there. You can you can download all that stuff and play around the tools. In there, under content uh, or maybe AI, actually, um, you'll find Jasper, and there's a free trial of that writing tool, which is which is kind of fun as well. Uh, just some final resources before questions. Right, you want to connect up afterwards on Twitter or X, if any of you are using Twitter anymore. Uh, Daniel Rolls, Instagram, if you want to connect up there. Really happy to connect up there. It's Target Internet, but that is me. And then on LinkedIn, uh, it's Daniel Rolls. So you can connect up in any of those places. Really happy to connect up there. In terms of the resources take away, the benchmark, uh, the website targetinternet.com forward slash benchmark, benchmark yourself, download the report for free, forward slash toolkit. You've got um, all the, the tools in there and then forward slash podcast if you want the, the weekly podcast. Quick little prize kind of giveaway for you as well. We've just relaunched our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash target internet. Uh, go in there and subscribe. And if you subscribe to that, any of the new subscribers we get over the next couple of days, uh, we're doing a prize draw and we're going to give away uh, a year's membership uh, to Target Internet to access all that online learning stuff as well. So if that's the key takeaway. Go to the YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Target Internet, subscribe in there. Um, and there's an opportunity to get free access to all our premium stuff as well. That is it from me in terms of slides. I'm sure Phil has potentially got some questions. Uh, so back to you, Phil, if you've got some questions for me. Uh, yes, we have indeed, uh, Daniel, another uh, brilliant presentation. Um, obviously, you do this presentation every year. It's amazing to see what things have happened over the last year. I, I, how can you I'll possibly predict what's going to happen in 12 months' time? It's uh, such a fast-moving industry. Um, okay, so we have got um, a few questions in already, but just a reminder that uh, you can still post those um, throughout the next uh, Q and A session. We'll probably spend about ten minutes or so trying to answer some of those questions. Also, just a reminder that if you want to find out more about the Marketing Club, you can use the QR code we've popped up on the screen here. And if you want to comment about the sessions or the socials, you can use the hashtag Show Events. Okay, so the first question, Daniel goes back to uploading data um, really at the start of your presentation. What are the GDPR impacts of uploading data from a CRM to chat GPT, for example, if you wanted to analyze client data? So what you shouldn't be doing uh, is uploading personally identifiable data. So there's a couple of things here. There are some professional tools that will allow you to upload data into an AI, but it will keep it in your private repository. So as long as you've got permission to use people's data in third-party tools that are private to you, you can do that. The thing is, things like GPT, unless you've selected it and you've got a pro account, it's going to use it to start training the AI a little bit more. So best practice would suggest do not go through uh, and start uploading personally identifiable information. What you can do is anonymize that data, upload it and analyze it, and then when you get it back, you can join it back together with anything that's personally identifiable as well. The other thing to be careful of is when you're may be saying, right, training it on some of your content, you're basically in many cases opting in to allow it to look at your content and train the AI on it. So in the pro situation, quite often what you're doing is going through and saying, I only want you to keep this in a personal repository. Uh, and ChatGPT, amongst others, is starting to give you the ability. Jasper does some of that stuff as well, gives you some privacy controls over things. The other thing we don't know from an ethical point of view is what these data sets were trained on. So if, for example, they're just trained on loads of websites and those websites are full of fake news, potentially AI will think that is potentially true as well. So there's a lot of ethical questions. It's a very good question because there's a lot of ethical questions starting to come out about this. So be well informed. Be aware of the legislation on privacy, what you can and can't share. Anonymize data wherever possible and don't share anything that's kind of private to your organization is my, my general advice unless you're absolutely sure of what the, the particular platform does with it. Okay, very good advice, so Daniel. Um, similar theme, what's the best AI tool to get insights from social media data? So what I would probably do, uh, there's a lot of data sets online in Kaggle, so K-A-G-G-L-E. Um, Kaggle will allow you to download lots of data sets like you know, Twitter comments about particular news stories or whatever it might be. So you, you need a data set to start from. The other way to do it, is to use a data scraping tool. So if you just search what is data scraping, 
we, we you'll find at top of Google we've got a tutorial about it and it will tell you how to scrape data so you could basically do a search in X or something like that you could grab some of that data um, there are limits into what you are and aren't allowed to grab um, but you could you could grab that data and then you can upload that into one of these tools and get it to analyze be careful of copyright and those kind of things but if I give you an example I could go in and uh, maybe do a search or find a website that's got all the mentions of the jobs in my location. And I can use the data scraping tool to go to all of those pages and download the job, job titles, the job descriptions, and the salaries. I could then go in and create a document of that, the data scraping, upload it into ChatGPT and go analyze this, tell me what the average salary is, the average salary with a job title includes nursing, and the average salary with a job title includes data. And it will be able to do that level of analysis for you. But you need the data in the first place. So you've either got to download some data from someone like Kaggle, or you've got to scrape that data in some way from somewhere else and get access to it. Or you can actually pay people like Twitter to have access to their feed um, in some cases as well. But you need to start with a data set. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, okay, is it okay to use AI for SEO? This is a good question. So about a year and a half, two years ago, Google came out and said, um, it's not okay to use AI generated content on your website. And if you do so, you will potentially be penalized in the search results, i.e. they will see you're using AI content and they'll punish you and push you down the search rankings. Then about eight months ago, Google came out uh, and said, good content is good content. We don't mind where it comes from. So what they're basically saying is like, we're gonna judge content on the same basis of quality. You can use AI tools to help you, but if you create rubbish, we'll work that out. And they've got all this stuff now about EAT, which is expertise, authoritativeness, and trust. They're trying to look at, is your website trusted? Are the people that are writing your website trusted? Um, are you exploring both facts and your opinions of things? And so, so if you look up EAT for SEO, you'll kind of see that. So yes, it's fine to use SEO tools, but you still need to create exceptional content. The thing I'd always refer people to is, is a, a guy called Rand Fishkin's 10X content. The idea of 10x content is you go out and say, I want to be number one for this in SEO. Okay. Research all the other stuff that's out there and really understand it and consume it and then go, how do I do something that's 10 times better? And if I don't do something that's 10 times better, I might as well have not done it because it's just not going to stand out. So you can use, you can use AI for SEO, but you just need to, when you're creating content, you just need to be sure that what you're creating is actually of high quality. And if you do that, it will still work as long as it's useful to the target audience. So that's the key. Is it valuable to my target audience? It's just, if you're still achieving that, then it's, it's perfectly valuable content from, from that point of view. There are lots of AI tools that will analyze SEO effectiveness and so on as well. They've been around for a long time. Most of the SEO tools like um, SEM Rush and things like that, to some extent, you're using artificial intelligence and analysis to, to do that. So it's okay, just be careful, make sure you're creating great content. Hey, thanks. Um... How do you recommend we reassure customers about how AI is used in marketing for industries such as banking, where customer trust is core to the business? Key thing here is clarity and frequency of communication. So people worry about things. Um, we did a debate at the CIM at the House of Commons, and, and we were arguing that the AI is not what poses a risk to the industry it's the use and regulation of AI and actually how we educate ourselves. So really good organizations, what they're doing is writing policies. This is what we do, this is what we don't do. But they're doing it in a way they communicate that to their customers and say, right, AI, this is how we're using it. This is how we're using the data. I want you to be clear on that, we won't do this. But they're having to update those policies on a really regular basis because that's gonna change. So I think getting together and working out what that policy should look like, what should you do, what shouldn't you do, and then having clarity um, with your customers about how you're going to do that. And that's got to align with your GDPR policy, your data and cybersecurity policy, and all those sorts of things as well. Um, trust absolutely is key. And it's really saying, we are going to use AI in this way, and this is where the benefit is for you. So kind of being really honest about those things. So we've had it with marketing agencies where they're using AI, and they're not trying to pretend they're not. Now, the risk is the customers go to you, well, if you're using AI, you're quicker, I want to reduce the fees. They say, no, everyone's using AI now. So actually, you know, we're going to improve our effectiveness, our efficiency, but 
we've still then got to create really exceptional content. So standing out from everything else is increasingly difficult. So I think it really is about creating those policies, updating them regularly, having those conversations internally and staying up to date with a lot of these things as well, which is challenging. But in reality, the regulators are not going to set the tone for this because the regulators won't be able to stay up to date. So as organisations, we have to prove our trust uh, by saying what we will do and really importantly, what we won't do as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, just changing tack a bit. Uh, could you please mention what the main or primary digital marketing skills are that you need to develop as a marketer in 2023? Yeah, I, I would say if you look at our digital skills benchmark, we break it down into 14 core areas. So, I mean, you don't need to know all of those. Um, you can download the benchmark and it will show you what the areas are. But, I, I mean, I would say if you look at analytics and data, so understanding measurement, really important place to start. I would say, yes, we want to kind of understand social media, but that doesn't mean understanding all of the channels necessarily. It's about the key principles. And in line with that is content marketing. So it's great to have search engine optimization skills, but you might specialize. You might say, and this is, there's always been an argument in marketing about this. Should you be a generalist? Should you be a specialist? Um, I was always a generalist but probably had deeper dive knowledge into uh, the technical and analytics aspects of things. So I think you don't need to be a generalist or a specialist. What you need to be is T-shaped. And what I mean by that is you need a broad set of skills to understand broadly all those different 14 areas to some extent. And then you have the bottom of the T, which is the bit that dives down into your particular area of expertise. So you can be a problem solver, but you can imply um, in-depth knowledge. If I were to look at the market now and say what skills are probably the most in demand, um analytics definitely content creation aligned with social media um ai prompting is, is a big one but i would say we still do email badly if you could be really great email there's still an opportunity for that um search optimization is constantly changing overall this really is the strategy piece as well because you should always take any marketing problem you should take a step back and say who's the target persona what does their user journey look like? What are their objectives? What are my organizational objectives? So I think having some of that planning knowledge, and that could be as simple as understanding a framework like SOSTAC, which is Paul R. Smith's um, framework, a planning framework. There's Dave Chaffee's race framework and lots of others as well. But I think you've got, you need to know your tactics, your channels. You need to know how to measure those channels. But also you wanna look at some of those planning skills. So you, so you do take a step back and think about personas, and user journey planning as well. So there's a, there's a pretty broad range of things in there and that's the challenge with that as well. But as long as you've got a framework that says I start with looking into the market, I work out my objectives are, um, I look at my channels, how I'm gonna use them and I know how to measure it. That's really key. I think GA4 skills at the moment are massively in demand. Um, so that, that's certainly something worth looking into um, from that point of view as well. But I think you also need to look at what you enjoy and what you're good at. Um, and if you can you know, in some way combine those two things. The other thing I would say is you get this terrible bit of advice, I think, this is personal opinion, uh, which is about, you know, do what you do, what you enjoy, do what you love. I don't necessarily love analytics, but I found I'm quite good at teasing out information from it. And if you become a good at something by becoming good at it, you can develop a network, you can develop a reputation and you can build a career off the back of it. So start with the 14 areas start to drill into them, understand, work out what you enjoy and you're good at, and then you can maybe focus your T-shape, that bottom piece, into those particular areas, but try and get that broad set of knowledge at the top. Sounds like a really exciting time, actually, to be in marketing, Daniel. So thank you very much for all of that. Unfortunately, although we've got loads of questions still left to ask, we run out of time. Um, so once again, Daniel, another fantastic presentation. Thank you indeed again. Um, Unfortunately, that's it for our Marketing Club webinar today. I would just like to thank Daniel again for delivering a fantastic presentation and we hope you've enjoyed the session. That just leaves me to say a final thank you to you for joining us today. We do hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.